what's going on, beautiful people? Welcome back to the Rated TK Podcast. Today, we have an amazing guest with us. This guy has literally made some of the best playwear known to mankind that I know of. You've seen his plateware. You may not know, have known who is behind it, but he provides plateware for some of the top restaurants in St. Louis. Today, we have Jeremy from Cherokee Street Ceramics. Jeremy, welcome on the podcast. Hey, right on. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. So tell people a little bit about you. How did you get into this whole like plateware thing? And like, how did you get into it? Right. Well, that's kind of a long story. I mean, so ultimately I was exposed to a lot of stuff growing up, ceramics being one of them. Mm-hmm. My mom turned me on to that and um, my dad turned me on to music. And so yeah. like, for the 20 years leading up to COVID, I was a musician, yeah. a professional musician playing around town. Um, and uh, just before COVID, I started doing some more ceramics as a way to kind of like get off the stage basically, you know, gotcha. go, go to my basement, do my thing. And um, in that time, I started meeting some people that had restaurants around town and um, it was just like one thing led to another. Yeah. And I, you know, I particularly like plateware because it's a thing you use daily. It's exactly. Not, you know, it's like the music we played was for the folks yeah. and the plates are for the folks, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, and so that's, ba- and it's just been a tumbleweed ever since. And for the last three years, we've just been cranking them out. Dude, that is so awesome. How does it, so you have literally, like, I mean, it's like everyone that you sell to, their restaurant turns to gold. Like, it's it's crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Whenever I see, like, you post, I'm like, dude, their restaurant is, like, phenomenal. And, like, that's why I wanted to, I was like, dude, we have to get his artistry in rated. Like, I wanted you to be a part of this experience. I wanted people to know about you. I thought it was phenomenal. I found out about you um, through some friends of mine, Nick Bogner, uh, Bernie from a car, like, and they were like, he's the best to do it. So I'm like, okay, let me hit him up. <laughs> and here we are six months later at Rated and the play where it's still being used on the daily basis and we freaking love it. Um, so tell people a little bit about like your journey with music and the artistry. Cause I know, I know your story, but the people don't really know your story. Right. Yeah. So, um, I started playing music in St. Louis, uh, when I was 25. Mm. Um, so well over 20 years ago now. And, um, and I really, my music was St. Louis music, you know? Yeah. And so St. Louis music is blues music, it's uh-huh. soul music, it's jazz. Um, and for me, it was blues music. Yeah. And I was gone for a long time. And when I came back, I only knew a couple people still in town and those were, you know, elder blues musicians. Yeah. And so, and I was a listener. I wasn't like, I had a guitar. My dad taught me how to play some chords, yeah. um, but I didn't know music. Gotcha. Um, and so basically we just learned on the streets 20 years ago and the oh old guy's gosh. like, oh, you have a guitar? I'm going to beat you to death with it, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, we go home crying from the gigs. Yeah. Like, oh, man, he told me I played so bad. And, <laughs> and then, you know, we started doing 300 gigs a year and touring oh, wow. around the country and, um, and really playing a lot of St. Louis music because to me it's the most, I mean, it's the most. Yeah. 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 St. Louis music is... Um, I mean, I don't know as much about the food, but when it comes to music, I can tell you that we have one of the greatest lineages of all time ever, ever. Yeah. Um, We just haven't necessarily written it down. Exactly. Right. So our people are Johnny Johnson and Chuck Berry and Fontella Bass and Miles Davis and Albert King. Uh And and the list is so long. Yeah. And so um, when I started playing, most of those people were still alive. Gotcha. And so we'd go to their houses. We wouldn't miss a gig. Uh, oh, wow. There's this uh, guitar player, Benny Smith, who is kind of like the guy I looked up to. And he yeah. was Ike Turner's guitar teacher. Oh, wow. Right? He just played every Wednesday at the Venice Cafe, you know? Oh, wow. Um, and so once he found out I had a guitar, it was over. You yeah. Know? And so um, so the group I played in mostly was called the Bottoms of Blues Gang. And yeah. it was a female singer and a harmonica player. And I played acoustic guitar. Nice. But we were like an electric acoustic kind of Gotcha. Thing, right? Okay. And then we spent um, three or four months a year in New Orleans and a couple of months out west. And then we wow. come back here. <laughs> uh, you know, and then I ended up um, working with the St. Louis Blues Society and I ran the Big Muddy Blues Festival. And it was like just so many people, you yeah. know. And uh, so I was like, well, let me go back to the clay, which is something I was doing before music when yeah. I lived out west. And um, it was a great meditation, you know. It's just you and the wheel yeah. and it's quiet and like – the only people you have to compromise with are the clay and the kiln gods. Yeah, exactly. you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, so, and it just, and it's, so it's been a natural evolution in that way um, for me to step off of the music scene, especially since so much has changed and yeah. almost everyone that taught me how to play is dead. Mm. Like we want, we've been to too many funerals, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's not true. There's a lot of guys right now who are alive. They're like, hey, man. <laughs> they're going to be watching this. Like, I'm not fucking dead. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, but they're in their 60s and 70s and 80s now, you yeah. know? And, um, and so that's, and I feel really, like, blessed to have 
been around those people and learned Definitely. not just music, but life and, you know, community. And St. Louis got a strong community, you yeah. know. Um, and so uh, also because of that, I know a lot of people in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like, I think with, um, like with Nick, we knew one of the bartenders who was like, hey, you should meet my friend Jeremy kind of thing. You know what gotcha. I'm saying? And so, um, or like uh, uh, Colleen at Milk Toast, right? Yeah. You know, like she was at the Venice Cafe where I played every Tuesday night, gotcha. you know? Yeah. So these are all like, we all make a lot of kinds of arts and I think a lot of people do a lot of different things, but we have to put all our energy into one yeah. so we don't get to curate. Like I've figured ceramics was over for me, you know? Mm. Like it was a good time. I learned from some good people and yeah. then, um, and now, uh, it's the thing that kind of like I do every day all day long. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's great. And I think that that's a lot of things. That's a lot of that's a key point that you made that I think St. Louis is really well known for. And I think it's the fusion of food and music and, and how they kind of go hand in hand. Um, because like when you think of a core memory, you think of two things. You think of um, smells and you think of sounds. And those are like the two things that food and music does for people it provides that experience so like i can literally point out right now the time that me and my grandma were cooking listening to anita baker while smelling the food that she was making so like that kind of it's a core memory you know what i mean so like what was a memory for you that you can think of growing up as a child that was like music and food like what was that experience or what was that moment whether it was like your mom was pulling something out of the oven or just something like that that had to do with food. There was just, it was always around. I mean, yeah. it's uh, music and food are two of, um, and I would add ceramics to that. Yeah. Um, are the oldest human, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, like it's old world stuff inside of us, exactly. you know, like way back when someone had to like go down to the river and carry the water in a ceramic jug. It's true. Back to the village and they were humming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So they're making food with it. They're like so for me, like I mean, it was always around our house. We had music around the house all the time. Yeah. You know, like my dad played guitar and it was always on the radio. <laughs> or like if we're in the car we had the little eight track player, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um and my mom is a good cook. Like really? she's like and she loves it. It's her thing. Yeah. You know, and it's um it hasn't rubbed off on me as much as my brother. <laughs> um but I I mean, yeah, I, you could, mom's a good cook. Yeah. What was what's your favorite dish that she made? Oh, Man, um, I know that's a hard one because I'm trying to think of my favorite dish my grandma would make and I can't think of it right now. I feel like, and also those answers change over time that's as true. we get older. Like the thing I look forward to now, you know, um, I mean, m mom's got like the veggie chili and the like veggie soup down. Really? Like she'll make it in gallons and we'll just freeze it. Are you serious? It, you know, but she can <laughs> bake. She, you know, um, she has a lot of recipes from her grandmother, you mm. know, um, that we do uh, latkes during the holidays. Oh, yeah, And yeah. so, like, you know, her potato latkes, like, we we don't really celebrate, like, uh, the religious holiday as much as her latkes. Really? <laughs> you know? Are you serious? And we got to go over there <laughs> early, and she's got my great-grandmother's grating, you know, things. Yeah. And, like, if, if you don't bleed, it, it then you didn't do it right. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Know? Like it, <laughs> so um, I would say her latkes, I look forward to those every single year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, again, there's always music when there's people in the house. And if you're making yeah. food for a lot of people, then it's just on. Exactly. And then, like, even for us here, like, we cook to a rhythm. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, like, when you're chopping something, it's, like, it's, it's a rhythm. Like, you know, there's a rhythm to what we do. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people don't really notice it. But, like, even the music that we play here, there's a rhythm. There's a beat to it. Whether we're, where there's Jorge shaking drinks, like, he's shaking it to a rhythm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Food and rhythm, like it's in that. It's in that. Even when you're you're doing, you know, ceramics, there's a rhythm to it. Like there's a beat, whether you realize it or not. There's a rhythm to all of those things. Yeah, I feel like there's um at the root of all of that is process. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so like the all of us, you know, if you're lucky enough to have like folks who are cooking during the holidays or mm -hmm. whatever, and we were kids, like the sound of my mom's mixer is in yeah, the back of my head. Exactly. You know? Like the dishwasher <laughs> or like when something goes over, you uh -huh. know, and all those sounds are like, I, I guess there's like a, a symphony in the kitchen. No, seriously. In, in, in any kitchen in yeah. that way. Yeah. I feel like we should put together like the, the, the soundtrack of the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the sizzles, the pots, the pans, the top, the, like all of that. I feel like it would be fire. Uh, no, I think that's great. Uh, we are going to jump into one of these snacks that you brought. Oh, all right. So typically what I do is I have the guests bring on a snack, either a childhood snack that they love to eat when they were a child or something that they currently love to enjoy. Um, so I'll let you decide which one we jump into first. 
We should probably do the first one from the kids, which okay. I also had to check in with mom about. Because, like, I remember, <laughs> but I'm like, no, hold up. She remembers better than me. Yeah, yeah, And so it was Fruit Leathers, and I still love Fruit Leathers. Yeah. And I'm like, well, which ones did I eat? And so I did a little research, and I found these ones, and these are the ones that I remember as a kid. Ah, okay. So we'll put the link down in the description if you guys want to try these Fruit, fruit Leathers at home. What's your favorite flavor out of the four that we have? I tried all four when I got them, and um, it's apricot. Really? Yeah. Because that's the one I was looking at. Apricot anything is just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's an underrated flavor. It is. No, it seriously is. So we'll we'll bust this one up yeah. and we'll and we'll we'll give it a shot. See what we're looking at. So typically why I have people bring this on is because our palates develop over time. Yeah. So like something that you may have liked as a kid, maybe you may not like it now. And so that's why I have people bring on a snack that they would grow up eating yeah. compared to if it's something they would like now. I think my mom tried to be healthier growing up. Really? And so these ones don't have that like fruit roll up feel. Gotcha. You know, like it doesn't yeah. feel like you're just gnawing on sugar. Exactly. Um, they, they tear well, you know. Yeah, they do. They feel authentic. They feel like real fruit. Like you know what I mean? Someone dried them out and put them in plastic. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Yeah. And these are all so these so we have apricot, mm -hmm. raspberry, strawberry, and sour apple. This is great. Yeah, I remember them as kids because you would take them to the park. They're easy to you don't yeah. have to cook them, throw them in the bag or at the pool or whatever. No, these are perfect because mm -hmm. they're not. They hold up well, first of all, and my mouth is watering as I as I mean that means I like it. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is great. And so what I've been telling people of kind of like breaking down the different steps and tiers of like rating food because we all realize we don't realize it but we all do it naturally we rate everything whether it's a smell or whether it's you know a plate like we all look at stuff and people are like either i like this or i don't like it and so the first thing that i always approach whenever i rate something is the appearance what does it look like so like for me i know for a fact that there's probably not food coloring in this this is probably just the natural color of the fruit and like, that's a huge plus for me because I know that it's going to be natural and it's freaking amazing. You get sour notes, you get like a pinch of salt, you get the sweetness, like it's perfect. Yeah, you almost feel like a little pulp afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's a little bit of pulp left in your teeth. A little, like this, there's, there's things there that makes it feel authentic. You know what I mean? So compared to when you had this as a kid, what would you rate it on a scale of 10? Oh, I still love it. Yeah. Yeah, I like uh, like pulling like, like, like a whole piece off, the uh -huh. whole, you know, and then like rolling it up and just like, sucking on it for a while you yeah. know just let it kind of uh yeah just mess around in your mouth for a while so no, seriously yeah i still love it i gotta get this a nine out of ten seriously yeah this is great i love this mm -hmm. i'm gonna order some of these now <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, i love this this is phenomenal so what was it like for you growing up did you have brothers sisters cousins relatives who did you who'd you grow around mm -hmm. well so i grew up in st louis mm-hmm Almost my entire family grew up uh, in New York. Really? So my parents uh, came here. Gotcha. And then, so like, as far as cousins and grandparents go, we'd have to go, you know, we went once a year to New York. And yeah. then they would, you know, all everyone would come there and that's where we'd all hang out. And, um, and that's where I like, so um, like I come, you know, we're like, we're, we're Jewish, but we're not like super religious Jews. Gotcha. So our, um, like in some ways the food is what makes us Jewish in yeah, some yeah. ways. And so like, Going to New York and knowing the difference between a New York bagel and a St. Louis bagel yeah, is there's real. Yeah, a huge it's difference. It's not even, they're actually two different kinds of food. I was going like, to say, yeah. They shouldn't even be categorized as the same things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like scallion cream cheese or, you know, yeah. like, like those kind of foods or things I got there. Uh -huh. um, we grew up in U-City here um, and with mom and dad, you know, well, I mean, it was kind of like what we could afford at the time. Like we had a lot of different kinds of ramen, like yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, but when it was good food, you know, like it'd be good food. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah, I mean, we kind of, I had a good, I have a brother, I have a younger brother who's like the best of all of us. Like he's just <laughs> an incredible human being. And, um, and we all picked up that good stuff and we had the love and, you yeah. know, like trials and tribulations of, living yeah yeah exactly you know, like that's gonna happen um, but i got really lucky i had 
really loving parents and I yeah. have a, a brother who I look up to, even though he's two years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Uh, I, I physically look up to my little brother now. So I'm like, how I'm tall? But yeah. I'm like, how the fuck did you grow that tall? Like, it's crazy. Yeah. How was that possible? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I think that's great. Cause I mean, it was the same way with me growing up. It was like, whatever my mom and grandma could afford at the time, but it felt like we were living luxury. It felt like we were living lavish because that's just what they made it feel like. They created an experience around food. Um, and so I was like, I want to provide this experience for other people because not a lot of people grew up having it. And I was very blessed and lucky to have that experience. I'm like, how do I provide this experience to other people? And how do I provide an experience? Well, when people sit at these tables, they feel like they can take a load off. They feel like they can forget about whatever bad day they went through and just make it feel like it's around the food. Like it, it brings a core memory to them. Like we had a guest the other day, we have a short rib on our menu right now and they almost like teared up. Cause they're like, my grandma used to make a short rib and served it with collard greens. Like it feels like I'm a child again. Like that's the experience that we wanted to provide. Um, but obviously every great chef, like any other artist needs a great canvas. And so that ties us to the plateware. And it's like, um, we, we, I personally build my dishes around the plateware first. So I build it around the plateware. I talk with the farmers to see what they have access to. And then from there, I get my inspiration. And so to work with someone like you, that's an amazing artist when it comes to the plateware and being able to provide those things for us has been incredible. So what is, what is the experience or journey like for you when it comes to gaining inspiration for your craft? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, okay, so I, I compare music and ceramics all the time because they're, they're so similar, yeah. you know? Um, and I, I imagine that being a chef is like this too, uh -huh. as, as far as process goes, and like you have good nights and bad nights kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but in my group, I was the only like rhythm guitar player, right? Mm. There's no drummer, really. Like it was just yeah, a guitar sure. player. So I played with my thumb and my fingers and yeah. kind of like could play both sides of it, you know? Yeah. And um, one of the things I loved about that position is that I'm basically the support staff. I'm the plate for gotcha. the, you know, like I still have to have a little flair once in a while, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. but for the most part, my job is to lay it down so everyone else can trust it and build their thing on top of it, Yeah. right? And so that's like a plate in that way. Uh -huh. Like you still want to be a solid plate, you, you know, like sometimes you want a little flair, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but if the plate is in the way of the food, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so I bring a lot of those lessons of mm -hmm. like not needing to be the person right out front, but the person supporting that person. Exactly. And, and Creating that har that harmony. Yeah. Yeah. And then we all do it together. Like, I mean, dishware and food go hand in hand, literally. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're eating out of your hands. Yeah. yeah exactly. right? Like, that's it. <laughs> like, so whatever it is that you eat off of, you know, um, like those are the things. And I think there's a relationship there that I just like continually explore. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I love that. And I love the fact that like everything is not the same. You know what I mean? Like every piece may have the same inspiration, but it's going to be different. And it's the same way with food. Like we can get a strawberry. Is it a strawberry? Yes. But does it look the same? No. And it, it's just organic. And I love that about it. I love that about all the plateware and, and things that you create because it's all organic. And I love that. And we were talking earlier about the process of the plateware and like how you don't use a mold. You hand shape every piece and it's very intentional the way that you do it and i think that that's freaking phenomenal <laughs> <laughs> thank you it's hard yeah, <laughs> yeah no i bet yeah it's a lot of measuring you know yeah. like it's a lot of being on time just like with music um within that though it takes away a lot of those uh like when you're not trying to be like really big yeah you yeah. know and then you can just be with it you know and um yeah like i imagine with strawberries too just like with some of this clay like when you look at the clay sometimes there's like these little dots in it or something uh -huh. well we go all the way back to wherever it was mined and the factories that made the clay or put it all together like yeah. there might be a few more of those pieces of stone exactly. on that side of the clay and so you cannot replicate it yeah and, yeah, yeah, yeah you know so definitely that again, being okay with that is mm -hmm. what I'm after. Exactly. It's like, well, it is what it is, but yeah. still like <laughs> it's intentionally not caring, you know, exactly. about that, that end of it. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. So for any young artist or, and it doesn't even have to be around certain ceramics or music, but just any young artist out there that's trying to get, that's one trying to be um, creative and innovative in their space. Um, but that's just getting started that really may not know what avenue they want to stick with long-term. Cause as artists, we pivot a lot. 
we pivot, whether it's the industries or whether it's the way that we approach it or whether it's working for ourselves or working for someone, it all changes over time. What's a piece of advice that you would give a young artist that's out there right now that may not know exactly what they want to do, but they know that they want to create? Yeah. Well, I would say two things. First of all, stay way out of debt. (laughs) Just stay out of debt. Like whatever you can do, keep your nut as low as possible because that gives you the ability to be flexible. Exactly. Right. If you owe or if you try to think you need more than you can pay for, you won't ever have time for art. (laughs) Exactly. Because you got to hustle it. Yeah. So I would say that's always something I wish people had told me early on. Yeah. Um, And then, you know, the second thing is um, I would say like, you don't got to pick what you got to do forever, but you got to pick what you're going to do next. And yes. whatever you pick, do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I played music every night for th- 20 years, you know, um, and when I chose to change, I didn't hang on to the other side, mm. you know, like you just take a trail as long as it goes and yeah. then you go on to the next one. And if some people are going to play that that they're going to play music their whole life. They're going to play for 60, 70 years. Yeah. And that is an incredible thing. And it's not better or worse than someone who does a different thing every year. Exactly. As long as whatever you do, you put everything into it. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's great advice. And I think that's what a lot of, that's what they don't teach us in school. It's like, they don't teach us that in school. So it's like, it's great to hear that because I believe the exact same thing. Whatever you put your passion and heart into as long as you're showing up and give it 150%, you're going to succeed in whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah, yeah. you might even find that, you know, you put all your, all your energy into one thing only to find out that that's what you had to do is to find the person who would show you the thing you actually wanted to do. Exactly. Right? So you got you to gotta walk it with, like, all of your everything. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and keep your bills down. Yeah. You know? That's good and, advice. Keep right. your bills down, kids. <laughs> <laughs> For real. <laughs> I learned that way too early. Keep your bills down. (laughs) No, I think that's great. Uh, We're going to jump into this other snack. Tell us a little bit about what else, what else we got over here. Okay. So um, during COVID also, I got married, which was kind of like a fun thing to do in the middle of a pandemic. I know, right? (laughs) Um, And, and my wife, Leslie, who is also a professional musician. Yeah. um, And she also runs a piano school and is just a lovely human being all around. Yeah. um, Has really like dove into the baking. Um, It's something she kind of always like played with. Gotcha. um, But she, the COVID gave us the space and time. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Was it a COVID hobby that turned into? She was doing it beforehand. So I don't want to say it was a COVID, but that gave us the space to play. Yeah. You know, like, um, so baking, and I I bet, you know, in some ways, like being a chef um, and with ceramics is like, you don't know how you did until the very end. Yes. (laughs) Right. So I actually started as a pastry chef. Okay. But that's why I left it because it's like, you don't know until the end. With cooking, it's a little bit easier. Like you can taste as you go. You can add more salt. You can add more vinegar. But like with baking, if your ratio and your math is not right, yeah. you're going to find out very soon. Right. So that's the same with ceramics. Like yeah. if I leave an air bubble in something, mm-hmm. I won't know until two weeks later when it explodes in the kiln. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so with COVID, I think there was enough time to kind of like try like, okay, so these are her millionaire bars. Yeah. Right? And she's made them dozens of times now, you know, and yeah. there was good ones and there was bad ones. And then there's the ones where she did everything right. And they still turned out bad because yep. the oven gods were like, no, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, like we were talking about snacks and like, I don't buy too many like Doritos, yeah. you know? Um, so what we've been eating around the house are her snacks are, and they <laughs> are really good. Yeah. Um, and these ones are cool because they're small. So like you can walk by the table like 10 times and just, and just, grabbing just, a grab, just grab a little one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. So that's what, the, that's where these came from. Well, let's dig in. Let's right. try them. They look phenomenal by the way. Yeah, so t- uh, tahini, caramel, chocolate, and um, I think it's almond on the bottom. Oh, wow. Dude. Why am I buying Doritos? Why? That's a very great question. Mm-hmm. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the this fruit, is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, so these are my adult snacks. Yeah. These are my childhood snacks. Dude, these are great. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to put it down. <laughs> it's also, I think, a little warm in here. So Yeah, because it's like gooey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, when, that's perfect. When they come right out of the fridge, they have that nice snap. Yeah. Yeah. No, dude, that is... Well, she ever wants to switch career paths. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go in business together. <laughs> Don't tempt her. Oh, my gosh. Dude, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I'm uh, lucky 
yet again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You scored with that one. <laughs> I'm way above my weight class. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's amazing. So what so what do you guys like to do that's a shared hobby that people may not know about? She and I? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, we're pretty much an open book. Anyone really? Who, yeah, if you took a look, you would know, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, we like... So I think St. Louis is fantastic in like almost every level. Where it falls short for me is like you don't always have a great view. Ah, uh, you know, like I yeah. like the mountains. I I like the desert. I like the oceans. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of like set it up where we work really hard at the thing that we love to do. Yeah. And then we get out of town. Mm. You know, and we just get real quiet and sit in the mountains or what yeah. have you. Um, but that's again, you can see that. I mean, like. I, as far as secret stuff, I don't know what kind of, I, that might be a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we, I mean, we like to have our hands in the earth, you know, like yeah. we're out there. We have our little back South City backyard and it's growing crazy. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we, like for the most part, we just like try to create a view that gives back to us. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, which is a seasonal thing right so it's processed like, uh -huh. no matter how nice your backyard is in the middle of february in st say, louis yeah. it's just dead yeah you know? it is um but we love to eat together you know we love to play music together yeah um we love to travel together like we pretty much we made it through all of covid without much friction at all if yeah. that says anything so Dude, that's like, huge yeah i think we're good yeah do you guys cook together not that much really? i mean there are things where like she makes one thing and I make the other. Like when yeah, we do too. dumplings, right? Like yeah. she'll put the dumplings on and I'll do the um, the like the greens in the the big stir fry. Gotcha. You know, so okay. I, like I'm a stir like everyone should stay in their lane. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like like I can do stir fries, I can yeah. do ramen, you know. Um, but when it comes to like uh, like meat, she does all the meat. Gotcha. You know, um, which we don't do that much anyway. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, we do cook together, but we, we're tending to cook two different dishes that go together. That comes together. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, I think that's great. And I think that's kind of like, kind of works like with your relationship with restaurants. It's like you guys are working on different things, but they come together at the table for the guests to experience one thing in harmony. Yeah. I mean, so like, let's look at the dining room table and what's on it. And yeah. You know, you can hear the music in the background uh -huh. and you got the vessels of whatever kind that you have, you yeah. know, because um, like, you know, ceramic pieces are, are wonderful, but they mean nothing compared to your great grandmother's broken coffee mug. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> Right. Yeah, so exactly. like, let's you know, like we put the meaning into them, you know, yeah. and then you have the food and you have the, the color or the flowers. Like, exactly. I mean, it's so human. It is. It is. Yeah. No, I think that's phenomenal. So like if if you were um, if you were to switch career paths, what would you be doing again? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> oh, man, there's another like three dozen things I'd like to do if I had like 20 years for each of them. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Like the one thing I have learned over my, you know, however, I'm almost 50 now, like, is that. Are you really? Uh -huh. Yeah. I'd be I'm, I'll be 49 this year. Holy crap. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. So wow. I've had many realities already. Yeah. And, um, and there's uh, like, it's really cool when you do stuff like intensely for a short period of time. Yeah. Um, and that is as, as worthwhile as doing one thing for a really long time. Yeah. And yeah you just never true. know what you can build until you can build it. And you need that time. You mm -hmm. can't hurry and get to be like, there are no St. Louis music legends that got there overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no matter what, you have to live your whole life as that. Exactly. Um, and so, if I had a, I mean, I like the road. It's the one thing I lost with music. Gotcha. Like, when music, when I couldn't tour, or, and before that, I was with the circus, and before yeah. that, I was on my own road. And so, like, with ceramics, it's not, like, I just, I'm not on the road as much. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I feel like there's a time with an RV or, a, <laughs> like, you know, a little camper or something. Yeah. Um, the where where I get back on the road, yeah. That's and then however you make the living around it, like gotcha. I'm I'm a person that's like find the thing you like to do and then find a way to make money at it. Yes. Make sure you do the second part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Because if you get stuck, then you're you're gonna be doing something you don't like. Right. You're gonna yeah. No, I think that's great advice. I gotta tap into the circus thing. Oh yeah. Let's talk about it. We can. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about well, it. Well, all right. So I finished school out in Washington State. Um, and through this crazy turn of events, I had a friend that was living with a clown. 
here in St. Louis, and I was living out of Washington State. That's a funny statement. Yeah, I know. Like, like I said, like, and I'm just giving you like the bare bones here. But, yeah, yeah. but the short version of it is I finished school out there, and, um, and I had called to talk to a friend here, and I ended up talking to her roommate who was a clown in a circus. And I went like, Kate, can you get me a job for yeah. the circus? And she's like, what can you do? You know? <laughs> and so I ended up, there's this, um, there's only a few of them left, but they, they, they're like old mud shows. So they go to mm. a different town every day oh, wow. for like eight or nine months. Right. Yeah. So, um, this one was called the Culpepper Merriweather circus. Mm -hmm. It's still around. Um, I think they're based out of Oklahoma now. Um, gotcha. So they, so basically it's a big tent, you know, and yeah. at the time they had mm -hmm. animals and elephants and high wire and they would pull oh, into wow. a, pull into a town before sun and set up the tent and do two shows that evening and tear it down and then go to the next town. Holy cow. For like nine months with no days off. Wow. Um, I would travel. <clears throat> so I was not a performer then. I, I traveled two weeks ahead of the show and mm. um, did seven towns every five days. Gotcha. Right. Okay. And met with the sponsors and walked the lots and did promotion and hit the radios. And because gotcha. uh, like often these little uh, circuses are fundraisers for, I don't know, the Qantas Club of yeah. West Nowhere, Missouri. Yeah. You know? yeah like, right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you'd meet with them to and they would sell tickets and get a percentage and that kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, okay. And again, makes it a community event. Um, yeah. And so I would just um, and this is all pre cell phone. Right. Exactly. So I had my little paper map. And I had to stop at the truck stops to call the people <laughs> to set the appointments and then figure out how to get there, you yeah. know? Um, and so I just crawled across the country, you know, for nine months. And right at the end of it, my RV blew up in Texas. Are you serious? It was, I beat that. I mean, it was not roadworthy when I bought it. <laughs> okay. Like, and I had like duct taped the thing and got it across the country Jesus. doing this thing. Oh, wow. Um, and I came back, that's when I came back to St. Louis and I was yeah. about 25. And um, that's when I met Carrie Liston, who was the singer in Bottoms Up, and Adam, the harmonica player. Yeah. And, uh, and also there was a magic moment happening in St. Louis at that time musically. Mm. And so we were birthed out of that. Gotcha. And I never went back on the road with Circus. I ran an office oh, wow. for him for a couple years out of my apartment. Yeah. Um, but I mean, again, like you have to choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it, it was a, a amazing thing to like just exp to this is an amazing country you yeah. know like the actual physical country is gorgeous yeah yeah um and desolate and far away if you yeah. don't know how far away you're going it's true you don't have a cell phone you know exactly um so when you were out there or you were out of gas in the middle of the desert you were out there oh, you know um and so i i really enjoyed that and <laughs> um, and i got the band on the road as soon as we could yeah. you know for that same reason yeah yeah um yeah, so that yeah, I just saw that they're opening like in March or something. So really, yeah, their next season, you know, and they'll crawl across the country. Yeah, again. that uh, is so cool. It's really cool, oh man. My gosh. Yeah, like it's um, I like communities, like small and large, that work together for a common purpose. Yeah, you know? and so that's a kitchen staff, mm -hmm. it's a circus crew, it's yeah. a band, you know. And um, whenever I see, I I don't know, I just really enjoy that. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, I love that. I love that, and I I. I agree with you on that like seeing people that are able to work cohesively together to achieve one goal is like it's so inspirational like it's huge like people are able to set their egos aside they're able to set their things their, their problems aside and just work together as one you know it's so crazy that you don't see it often much but when you see it it's like holy cow like they are yeah yeah and i mean even these small a small kitchen like mm -hmm. yours or a small circus like that yeah um like that that's the bigger side of it. Like I see it happening on the streets. I see it at, at yeah. the supermarket when someone drops their keys mm -hmm. or like, okay, like all the checkout people are gone. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm yeah. saying? And we all have to figure this out together. Exactly. Um, or a snowstorm, right? Yeah. Like, and all of a sudden we're shoveling our neighbor's driveways and yeah. all that other stuff that didn't matter to start with, yeah. like gets thrown away because we have to get to water or mm -hmm. we have to do this. Again, like a real human thing. Yeah. When we can take out all the other stuff, like, and we all just work together for a common goal. It, it works almost every time. It does. It, it really, really does. does. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> What's, so with you being born and raised in St. Louis and have traveled across the, the country, um, what's one thing that you wish that St. Louis could do better? Huh. I'd say easy. Uh, uh, we already talked about the music and we already talked about like the food and all that kind yeah. of thing. But the truth, like... I wish St. Louis would tell its own story, mm -hmm. you know, um, and the story, like we just take it on a musical tip, but we could take a 
on all of the different parts of it yeah. is um, gold. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, yeah. like you look at, you know, the reason people think of Chicago and Memphis or whatever as blues cities or as music cities is because they told you they were music cities. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And um, it seems to me that in this city we have every bit of story that New Orleans has, mm. you know, um, but we've never used it as an economic commodity or for pride yeah you know and I, I mean we're just talking on the music side of it but again apply it to everything yeah right yeah. and um but we live in a city that for whatever reason cannot get out of its own way i mean yeah. well we know some of the reasons right you know yeah, yeah um but like it's so easy it is right like it's so easy and it's it's so easy that you almost think like why, why are they not doing it? And it's ours. Nobody else can have it. Yeah. Right? It's not like a, it's like there's oil under the city mm -hmm. and no one's dug it up to sell it. Yeah. You know? Um, and every time, I mean, we go into this, but like every time we start working in that direction, about seven years later, it just falls out. And yeah. we haven't built any of the structure. Like, well, I mean, so to, again, like I get, you, I could rant for hours on this. <laughs> but, you know, like, you know, we have one of the, greatest blues R&B soul uh, stories in the world, yeah. right? And I was at the you know bookstore in St. Louis recently, and there's a whole wall of St. Louis books, and there's not mm. one about really? St. Louis blues music, you know? Oh, wow. Like, there's one that came out a while back that is out of print. There's yeah. Henry Townsend and Johnny Johnson's books are out of print, and there's a, a newer one that's um, just a lot of information, not a real easy read, gotcha. you know? Gotcha, yeah. Um, there's nothing on the wall. Like wow. Chuck Berry is there or John, I mean, and you know, yeah. like we all have different favorites, but like, this is a real easy thing. Like in, like in New Orleans, it doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, like yeah. you'd be old and rich or poor and young. And like, you have music and food in common. Yeah. You put those two strangers in a room in another place and they'll have trombone shorty in common. Yeah, they'll yeah, have exactly. red beans and rice in <laughs> common, you know? And we have all those things in St. Louis. Yeah. And um, instead, of le and instead of using those things to bring us together, right, to, you know, I guess if you were, like, thinking from the government side, to bring uh -huh. tourism in to give us money yeah, for yeah. our own story. Exactly. Which is what, I mean, again, gold, no one's used it. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Um, then we'd have this thing where we're all on the same side. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, like, I know we have a lot of problems. And also, among all those problems, we have some of the most amazing people I've met anywhere. I completely You know, agree. I put my life online for them. They would do the same. Yeah. Like, um, but this one thing where we could tell our story, you know, all of it. Yeah. W without being mad because it happened because none of us were there none of us were there right? but we're That's, here yeah. now yeah. right so anytime we have a mic we should be telling this story i agree yeah. um and we should all be proud that it's ours yeah because yeah. no matter who you are in st louis albert king is part of your heritage yeah you know it whether just, you know it or not right it yeah. just is like like it, like louis armstrong is to new orleans an yeah. unborn child down there is a louis armstrong person and like yeah. here too for albert king or for benny or ike or tina or yeah. like take your pick like it it goes on, um, and that music is being played every night of the week here. I still. agree. Yeah, it is for free. Yeah, <laughs> you know, almost. Um, so yeah, that would be the thing. I would. I've been waiting for. I don't know. I guess I really opened my eyes in my late teens here. Yeah. And so for thirty years, and then you talk to the guys that are seventy and eighty now, and they've been waiting for sixty or seventy uh, years. Yeah. No one, you know, and we get these little blips, but holistically mm -hmm. our story of music and food and the history of the United States and all the things that come with that. Yeah. You know, put that on paper, put it in documentaries, give people, it's jobs. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And pride. I agree. Like the two things we need. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's, I could like, dude, that's some amazing insight. Cause I never thought about that. We are not telling our own story. No. That we have, we have it. We don't, no one has to pay for it. No, it's we don't even done. have to like embellish. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I know Austin had a bunch of great musicians through it, but it's nothing yeah. compared to St. No. Louis. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, or uh, any of these other new music cities. Like, and then when you go to those places, those people aren't from there. No, they're not. Everyone here is from here. Yeah. It has been influenced by this music from here and it is passed down because there's so little recording. Mm -hmm. Right. There's no archive. Right. Exactly. So like. Literally, I know these licks because this guy taught me licks and the guy before him t invented the lick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. So like that's how it gets passed down here. Um, and I wish that more people could, it could be passed down to. Yeah. Yeah. That's some amazing insight. I love that. 
Dude, this was great. I appreciate your time. I think this was phenomenal. Um, just one one more bit of advice to anyone that's watching. Just what do you just what do you have? Off advice? The you yeah. know, I don't know if I have enough gray <laughs> hair yet to be just tossing <laughs> advice out. You know, uh, you know. Hey, look, I just say, um, you know, have some empathy for the person across from you. Always. Yeah. That, I mean, this has nothing to do with art or food. I mean, this is where we talk about that stuff is yeah. around art and food and music but exactly. like you know just just know there's some people going through stuff you have no idea about and you're back there honking your horn yeah yeah you know and so just try just do your best yeah you know like just to have a little empathy yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it makes my day better i agree yeah and it makes you it makes not only that person feel better it makes you feel better for doing that you know what i mean no i think that's great um, Jeremy, where can people find you? Um, so uh, you can contact me through Cherokee Street Ceramics mm -hmm. um, dot com. Uh, I'm available on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I only do a handful of shows a year, so yeah. um, I'm at like once a month at Tower Grove Market in South St. Louis. Um, I'll be doing a couple larger art shows this year. Oh, nice! Um, but for the most part, the way to do it, I don't sell a whole lot online. Yeah. So um, you really got to be, you got to come find me, um, yeah. or come set up a studio visit. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, this was an amazing podcast interview with Jeremy. We were just here chatting. Uh, you guys can find his information down below. Jeremy, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you for everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. You guys can find all of his information down below. Thank you guys for tuning into another Rated TK podcast. We'll see you guys in the next video. Peace. Peace.